Amen. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Danny. And uh, what an awesome testimony of, of the care team at work. And, um, and I also feel like we need our snowblowers still after how cold it is. So um, I broke out the sweater bin again last night. Um, so um, I hope you enjoyed summer because we're back into, uh, back into fall. So, um, but as, as we continue our series in, uh, in the book of James called Faith That Works, I think it's so fitting that we have a testimony about the church working because of their faith and, and, and the church taking care of one another because of the faith that is in them. And this week, as Danny read, we, we come to a passage in James chapter 2 that may have even more confusion, debate, and misunderstanding than the one we covered last week, if that's even possible. James is continuing on the statement he makes in verse 17 of chapter 2 when he wrote, So also faith by itself if it does not have works, is dead. After saying this purpose statement in in, in verse 17 that ties back to verse 14 and, and, and even further back to hearing and doing the word, James employs in our passage today a common grammatical strategy called a diatribe, which in a sense is just he's giving a hypothetical argument, a hypothetical objector who is making his case against what James is writing. So in verse 14, or or in verse 18, when James refers to a someone, that someone is a viewpoint that is theoretically arguing with James's viewpoint. Now there's a strong chance that this viewpoint in verse 18 from this someone may represent a faction in his congregation that he's writing to, or one of them, but it's not known. It's more of a theoretical hypothetical argument. So what does this someone say according to James? The objector to what James has been writing about says, you have faith and I have works. The main point of this counterpoint to James is that faith and works according to this someone can be separated for salvation. You can just do one and expect to be saved. Well, how does James respond to this viewpoint? The first way that James responds to this viewpoint is to say that theological correctness is not enough for salvation. Theological correctness is not enough for salvation. As this objector puts forward that faith and works are able to be separated, James writes this in the second half of verse 18 and following. James says, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. James begins to tell his opponent to show him their faith apart from their works, which which essentially is that faith that James talks about earlier. That is just faith in profession only, but actually doesn't change the heart. And that's when James reminds his opponent of another group that has a profession of faith without works, and that's the demons. The statement that James mentions, God is one, is a reference to a passage in the book of Deuteronomy known as the Shema. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 and this verse is the bedrock of the Old Testament. In it, the people of Israel are told, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It was a statement that means that there's only one God. Statement that God is perfectly above all and in all. That there's no idol that can compare. Every other idol, every other false god is nothing compared to the God of Israel. It's a statement of fact, a statement of reality that God is one. He's perfect in every way. The parallel today for us in the post-resurrection period, in addition to the Lord is one, may be that Jesus is Lord. Stating the fact or the reality That every other deity, every other worldview, every other god or idol is nothing compared to Christ. It's the most orthodox statement of belief, and it is theologically correct, but as James reminds us, being theologically correct doesn't mean you have salvation. The demons understand perfectly well that Jesus is Lord. After all, they witnessed his triumph over death and sin on the cross. They know that the other deities and religions on this earth are nothing. They know that God is one and that Jesus 
is Lord, but it stops there for them. They don't believe in him for salvation. They, they know the facts that Jesus is Lord. And the God of the Bible is the only God. And every other God or deity put forward by religion is nothing. That the demons aren't scared by those things. They're not scared by these man-made religions. They are scared of the God of the Bible. The God of Israel and Jesus Christ and his power and divinity. And they actually work to thwart the mission of God. But it doesn't have any effect on them. And like the passage we talked about last week, where James showed his audience the absurdity of a profession of faith without action, here he does it again by showing that if you have only the intellectual and theological facts about God, you are still on the same level as the demons when it comes to whether you're saved or not. Even if you like the facts about God, which would separate you from demons because they don't like the facts. They can't stand the facts that Jesus is Lord, that he died on the cross, that he forever defeated sin and death. But the question remains that James is implicitly asking, have you actually been changed by the gospel? You know the facts, you know scripture, you know that Jesus is Lord, but have you been changed? Is your heart different? Because the demons know it and, and they're not different. As the scholar on James, C.L. Mitten, says, he he summarizes this well. He says, it's a good thing to possess an accurate theology, but it is unsatisfactory unless that good theology also possesses us. The demons have a great theology, which is to say they know God very well, and they tremble at it. They shudder. They're fearful. So for us today, even in the church, if you grew up in the church, are you there with the knowledge of God, and are you changed by that knowledge of God? Is your heart different? Have you, been, have, have you bowed your knee to Jesus as Lord? James establishes with this objector here that theological correctness cannot save you, but he continues in answering to the objector in a different way about faith and works and giving two examples of people who displayed this concept, this idea, this reality of faith and action. And the first example is the person of Abraham. Abraham is considered the father of Judaism, and his life is documented in the book of Genesis. James puts Abraham forward as an example of faith and works by giving the example of when God called Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar. If you know the story of Abraham... We know that in Genesis chapter 12, God calls a man named Abram who lived among a pagan people in a pagan land. And God called him in Genesis 12 saying, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Even though Abram and his wife Sarai didn't have children, he believed God and made the journey. Fast forward many years later in a few chapters in Genesis, God makes a promise to Abraham, who's now about 86 years old, that he would have a son of his own. That would be an heir of the nations. The nations that God promised him in Genesis chapter 12. God made a covenant with Abram. And verse 6 of chapter 15 says that Abram believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And though Abram and Sarai's faith did waver, because we're not perfect, though they sought to bring about God's will through different means, through, 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 through having a son through a different woman, God was faithful. And about 14 years after his last promise to Abraham, God provided Isaac, the son of promise, to Abraham and Sarah. This was the fulfillment of the promise that Abraham believed for so many decades. He had one son now who would be the heir to the nations that God had spoken about. This promise that he was clinging to. And we then come to Genesis chapter 22, with the account that James here is referencing. Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 8. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, 
and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the, fi- the, the fire and the knife. So they both went to, uh, of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. Well, we know the end of the story. In Genesis 22, Abraham is about to follow through on this command from God to offer his son as sacrifice, the heir of the promise that he believed. And yet God knew that Abraham wouldn't need to fulfill or follow through on this because he provides a ram to sacrifice as a substitute instead of his son Isaac. And God saw Abraham's faith through his obedience. The second example that James gives is a woman named Rahab. The people of Israel are led by Joshua at this time. God is leading his people to take the promised land. And that was referenced all the way back to Abraham, all the way back in Genesis chapter 12, this land that would be given to the people of Israel. The only problem was this land was filled with massive people and even more massive fortifications that were intimidating. So Joshua sent two spies to the city of Jericho, one of the most fortified cities in the world at that time, to scout it out. And the spies got to Jericho, and they lodged with a woman named Rahab, whose profession was being a prostitute. And as they're staying there, maybe thinking that staying with her would, 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 would keep them maybe undercover a little more, the king found out that there were two spies from the nation of Israel. And as the king sent soldiers to Rahab's house, we read in in Joshua chapter 2 that Rahab hid the men and told the soldiers that the men had actually left the city. Now, why would Rahab do this? Why would she hide these two spies from Israel? Why would she risk her life for them? We see the answer to that in verses 8 and following of Joshua chapter 2. Before the men lay down, she she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and the fear of the Lord has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction." And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. Rahab had heard of the God of Israel and the works that he had done for his people. Rahab noticed that these people were different. These people were set apart from the nations, which manifested itself in this radical act of obedience and courage from her because of her faith that the God of Israel is God in the heavens and the earth. In both of these instances, with Abraham and Rahab, we learn a simple truth about what true faith looks like from James. And that truth is that faith works by nature. Faith works by nature. What the readers see from the examples of these two very different people, Abraham would eventually become the father of Judaism. He would be the father of of, of all the nations. And Rahab was a Gentile prostitute, both imperfect and yet both Faithful, Rahab even being in the genealogy of Jesus Christ for her faithfulness. 
But the similarity between them, these two very different people, is that faith works out in action. It is a natural outflowing from faith. If you wanted to plant a fruit tree or a fruit plant, and you buy a seed for that plant or tree, within that tiny seed is the DNA of exactly what type of fruit will grow from this tree. It's contained in that tiny little seed. Fruit isn't extra credit for the tree. You don't have to add, you know, pay extra to get the fruit to come on the tree. It's baked into the seed. It's baked into the DNA of this seed. In a similar way, outworking of faith isn't extra credit for Christians. It's not extra credit. You don't get extra kudos from God if you do some good works. It's baked into salvation by grace through faith alone as a natural indicator of real faith. As we talked about last week, it is absurd, truly absurd, to claim to be a follower of Christ and yet not show any fruit in any measure. Because faith works by nature. For the Christians in the first century, the audience that James is writing to, works were assumed to come with faith, which is something that isn't emphasized as much in the American church today. But for James, it was paramount. It was so vital. Which leads to the last piece of teaching that James gives to us today. And before we conclude this sermon On this difficult passage, we must again untangle the teachings of James and Paul. I know we did it last week, and there can be confusion even the last passage, but again, there's confusion between James and Paul. And what we must understand today is how they both use the word justified in their teachings. As with James 2.17, verse 24 in our passage today has been a challenge for many throughout history. So when James writes, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. It's a challenge because it seems to fly in the face of what the Apostle Paul says about salvation. Of of what it is and what it isn't. That it's by faith alone, as he says in Ephesians, and not by works so that no man should boast. But here, James says that A person is justified by works and not by faith alone. So which is it? Again, we have this again. Just like last week, we have which is it? Is it James or Paul? Well, it's both. The main thing we have to look at is the usage of the word for justify and and how it's used in Paul's writings and how it's used in the writing of James. Context is so important. One very important thing to note is the context in which both men are writing. In Paul's writings, he is refuting the Jewish legalism that said that you have to observe all the Jewish commandments, everything you have to observe in order to gain salvation. Paul is, Paul, Paul is writing against that. He's writing against the requirements of the law to be saved. But James, on the other hand, was dealing with the opposite problem. He was, he, he, he was encountering a style of faith that swung to the other polar opposite, saying that no expression of fruit was necessary at all. That if you claim to be a Christian, you don't need to have any works. You don't have to show any fruit because it doesn't matter. So we have to understand the context in which they're writing. Another factor to consider is language. When Paul uses the word justified, It's clearly referring to being made right or or being saved, salvation, being made right before God. Like in Romans 3.28, as Paul is talking about the law and its requirements, he writes this, For we hold that, that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Works of the law, meaning the Jewish customs, meaning observing all these things in order to obtain salvation. So here we have justify being used in context of being made right before God, in context of refuting observing Jewish laws in order to be saved. But when we look at James, he does affirm that salvation is by faith. As we see in James chapter 1, when he talks about receiving with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. Receiving, not working, receiving with meekness the implanted word. And notice he also quotes Genesis 15, 6 in our passage today. 
that Abraham believes God, believed God and was counted to him as righteousness. One thing we have to understand is the context of the book of Genesis and the story of Abraham. That Abraham offered Isaac a sacrifice after he had believed the promise of God. He didn't offer Isaac in order to obtain salvation. Abraham believed, it was counted to him as righteousness, and his obedience was the outworking of his faith. That's why context is so important to understand what the Bible is saying, to understand what the cross references are, what the context is, to understand the meaning and the richness of James chapter 2, verse 24. And notice again that James doesn't say, in our passage, that a person is justified by works and not by faith. He says that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. That word alone points back to verse 14. And what James has really been railing on this entire chapter, which is faith by profession only and no works. Theological knowledge, mental assent, but no heart change. That's what James is referencing. So, of course, someone is justified by works and not by faith alone because if you just have a profession of faith, then you're not going to have those works that point to it. His point isn't that works save, but but that they are an indicator of a true saving faith. So James is using the word justified, not in the Pauline sense of salvation, but in more of an authenticating, prove-it way of faith that comes by grace By faith alone. Where Paul uses justified to speak of someone being made right before God, James uses the word justified in relation to what people see. God knows our hearts. God doesn't need to see our works to know that we're saved. But James is speaking of works as a witness, as a testimony. That we can look at the examples of, of, of Abraham and Rahab and see that they were living out their faith. That they had this genuine faith and it came out in obedience. And that's what James is pointing at. And again, this is a challenging thing for us in the American church to kind of wrap our minds around because of the individualized nature of faith sometimes. But James points to works as a sign that we are to show the world that we're saved. It's a witness. It's a testimony. So in response to this objector, that faith and works can be separate, James responds with saying that theological correctness isn't enough to save. There must be a heart change. James also uses the examples of Abraham and Rahab to show that faith by nature works. Like these two examples from the Old Testament, action was a natural response to their belief on the promise of God. They believed and then they had the outflowing of works. And finally, James would respond to the objector like Paul, who would come to it from faith alone. But James would come from a different perspective, using different language. That salvation is by grace through faith, and it is vindicated or authenticated by works. And as James ends this topic in in this letter, just as you can't separate the body from the spirit and the spirit from the body, you can't separate Faith and works. They, they go together in that order. Salvation by faith alone, which will then lead to fruit. You can't separate them. And again, it's a challenging passage. And yet it's one we have to wrestle with. Because the world is watching. The world is watching the body of Christ. The world is watching followers of Jesus. And James makes it very clear here. You cannot separate faith and works, and yet how many Christians today have done just that? Profession only, and yet no no semblance of fruit in their lives. God only knows our hearts. It's not our place to judge. But consider your heart this morning. Consider where you are with the Lord. Ask yourself, is there fruit in my life? Is my profession of faith being backed up with the fruit that Jesus tells us to look for, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. It's a question we all must continually ask ourselves because it's a witness to the onlooking world. Let's pray.